so I, uh, I, I'm so excited about this episode. I, um, I know how much sustainability matters. You know, we just had COP26 not too long ago, and we we wrote a blog post. Uh, Polina here authored the the, the blog post um, as part of our team, and the importance of sustainability in in, in business and and businesses thinking sustainably. And so to talk about that subject, I invited two of my favorite people on this planet, Joy Howard and Ingvar Helgeson. I'll tell you um, a little bit about them in a second, but um, I think the products themselves, I'd love to, to have them uh, tell the story about what they're working on a little bit more. Ingvar, I, I met a long time ago now, um, but he's got an amazing background in the world of, of fashion and, and he's worked in understanding the, the types and needs of customers there and, and Joy has also come from um, the retail side of things, uh, having worked at Patagonia and, and Sono. So both very accomplished in understanding the needs of customers and how they behave and how they choose things. So with that, uh, maybe Joy, you can start telling us a little about, a little bit maybe more about you, your team and, and what you're building with Early Majority. Sure. So. Um... I founded a company called Early Majority. We kind of got going earlier this year. We were born out of the pandemic, like lots of, of new businesses. And uh, we're basically building a technical streetwear brand that makes outdoor gear for all eventualities. And we stand uh, for gender equality as a team. We're all, we're all very much rally around that ideal. And it's really important to us because we're operating in categories that have traditionally left out the woman's point of view. So we're a group of people who care passionately about um, making this kind of product and doing it in a way that, that reduces our environmental impact, but also empowers women to lean out. And that's all about living a life where we are creating new structures rather than and, and new ways of living that connect us more deeply to the things that we care about primarily and, and many things that we were abandoning before the pandemic, which are our activism, our sense of adventure, our connection to art, our connection to nature, our connection to each other. So the brand is really about that and um, that's what we're making. Excellent, Ingvar. Thank you so much, um, Carlos, for having me here. Yeah, so um, here at Vitra Labs, we're building uh, a new supply chain for leather. So uh, what do we do? We uh, create real leather, cultured leather from animal cells and uh, we're really, the mission is to decouple the leather industry from the food industry, from the meat industry. And uh, by creating a new source of leather, but a leather that, you know, grow, growing hides that allow us to work within the, within the established supply chains of companies and uh, really allowing the brands to have a new source of leather that has all the same properties that people know and love about leather and uh, gives the designers, the creatives, the same uh, ways of working with leather. So again, there's no, there's no, um, we don't have to compromise on the, the qualities that can be made, the, 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 the textures, the fields, the colors, and all those, those different aspects that, that, um, that are really important for the creatives to be able to create these beautiful products that you have in market today. So um, we set out to create this new source of um, leather that, uh, that can work uh, ex in, inside the existing frameworks that, that are established in the leather industry and in the, in the fashion industry. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for those introductions. I guess I wanted to touch a little bit on the nature of the consumer and to hear both on like your B2B perspective side, uh, Ingvar, and your uh, B2C side, Joy. I think in my generation, especially, we're kind of on the brink of knowing that there's real harm in some of the companies that we indulge in as purchasers, purchasers, um, but are also aware of like these new up and coming companies. But I think sometimes that like what I personally struggle on is differentiating whether like we know whether there's some greenwashing going on um, and also learning how to be like an activist, activist in itself as a consumer. Um, so I guess, Joy, I would love to hear how we as like consumers and purchasers um, are empowering belief-driven choices. Well, it's actually really great for us both to be on here because I'm, I'm obviously a, a very eager consumer of what Ingvar is making. And, and, and I see my role as really educating consumers around why that would be a good choice. And, and in many ways, it's a very difficult thing to do because 
there are, you know, there's so much about building a business sustainably that, that's really, really hard. And eventually it always results in a higher price. And so you always have to try to pass on, you know, all of that hard work to, to someone who has a very limited attention span and mostly just, you know, doesn't want to have to think about it too hard. So, you know, I think your observation that there is a lot of greenwashing is true. I mean, I think it's really reached kind of like peak levels of, of you know, um, anything that I've ever seen in my career. And I've been in this space for a long time. Um, and at the same time as, you know, it, you know, you want to be critical of greenwashing because I really admire companies like Interface. You guys may not know they're such pioneers in, in sustainability. They actually have really embraced, I think, the only claim that anyone should be going for these days, which is carbon negative, right? They're actually, they, they are in such a carbon intensive industry that making an actual, and they're carbon neutral, which is crazy. And now they're making something that's carbon negative. So you look at a company like that, that has just walked the walk so incredibly for 20 years, you know? And then you see another company that's like very new on the horizon with a claim that's really gimmicky or, you know, something that you, you know is just kind of like faking the funk a little bit and it's hard not to be critical. But what I would say actually is that I'm, I, I am more um, accepting of some of these moves that people would see as kind of performative because it actually over time does lead to a change in consumers' perceptions and their behavior, right? So if you think about uh, a social change like you know, marriage equality. Like there was a time when that was like a very controversial issue, but partly because so many companies kind of got on the bandwagon. Now we kind of all accept that like, yeah, you know, everyone, you know, everyone should be able to love whoever they want. So I guess I'm of two minds about it. Like on the one hand, I think there's a lot of stuff out there that's very superficial and it is really, really, you know, um, annoying to those of us who are working really hard to, to build something that's, you know, radically different and, and, and very true to our ideals of sustainability. On the other hand, you know, it's exciting to see that everybody wants to go there and that consumers are so interested in spending their money with companies that are working for a positive change and, and reducing their environmental impact. Yeah, to follow on that, I think, I mean, we've seen a huge shift in consumer behavior. Um, we've seen the understanding of people's actions when it comes to cons uh, cons uh, consumption um, has um, it's, 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 a, it's a drastic um, change that we've seen. People are asking questions of the companies that they're buying from now, uh, because of course now we do have this we do have this kind of direct almost um, access to the brands that we love um, through social media and through through other channels. So, so those questions can be asked directly and, um, and, and it's really telling which companies are answering the questions and which companies are kind of just brushing it away. So I think consumers that, uh, the consumers of today like to have a dialogue with their brands, not just kind of top down, we make this product, buy this product because we tell you to, but it's really kind of a dialogue that has, uh, that has started to happen. And uh, that is something that allows, of course, consumers to ask those harder questions of companies. And, uh, and I feel that companies that can answer those questions honestly and openly and ideally with some data behind it, I know that you know, if, um, anything that where you know, companies creating life cycle analysis and, 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 um, and things like that, I think, I mean, it, it takes time. Um, it's amazing how little information that is about how we used to do things. Um, so there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done on just kind of the, the, the fundamentals of understanding the impact that, the, that we were having before. Um, and um, so that, that is something that takes time, but, but that conversation is already happening and that work is already being put, uh, put, put in place. So kind of creating the foundation of understanding how things were um, is essential to then being able to show how we can do things better. Because of course, if we don't have that insight, if we don't have that understanding, we won't be able to make the necessary changes. So again, going back to greenwashing, yes, absolutely. There are a lot of companies that kind of not ne don't necessarily talk too much about kind of the actual impact that they're having, rather than they just talk about kind of we're having a good impact. So I think you know now and 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 in the years to come, it will be much more important to have those 
Um, and we're not going to be asking people to read through a hundred page report, a uh, detailed report on, uh, on, on kind of the, the kind of detailed impact that companies have, but, but really, I mean, getting the kind of getting the highlights out there, getting the uh, creating kind of easily digestible um, slides that people can kind of can comprehend and can make informed decisions about. So I think the consumer today is asking those questions. And uh, some companies have been doing this for a long time, being really uh, open and honest about kind of the impact that they're having. But uh, but we're going to see that sea change of 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 the kind of honesty as brand um, have to they have to be honest towards their consumers. So following up on that thread about being honest with your consumers, you guys are consumers as well. I mean, maybe more specifically, uh, well, to some extent, you Ingvar, but Joy specifically, consumers of a supply chain, and that supply chain is part of. The, the problem and, and one of the interesting things that I heard about, and maybe this is not true, but I, I, I read it somewhere uh, that in COP26, there was a, a fleet of Teslas that were being charged with diesel generators because there weren't enough charging points, right? And so it's like you, you have this front end that's authentic, here's this Tesla, and then the back end is as carbon inefficient or as, as, um, as, as polluting as anything else. And Supply chain is a huge part of it. And the reason why I said consumer is because Ingvar, you are part of this, the supply chain and you're part of that solution. So maybe we'll start with you, Joyce. Like, tell us a little bit more about um, what the, the, the transfer risks for, for you are from migrating from, let's say, the usual suppliers that have decades of experience delivering high quality products um, to a more sustainable supply chain, delivery times, quality of product, you know, all the things that we've cracked uh, now being reopened with a new supply chain. Well, actually, I mean, the, so first of all, there have been so many challenges and, and one of them is actually a, what you call a great problem to have, which is there's so much demand for sustainably produced materials that there's incredibly long lead times, like intense competition for them. You know, it's really limited our choices because there's so, it's, we just struggle so much to get our hands on, it, you know? So, so that's wonderful, but it's also very hard as a startup because obviously, you know, a really big company that wants to do kind of like a, what I kind of call it like a trophy move. And, and, and I think there's been a lot of this in the leather space. So I'm going to talk specifically about leather because we've really, really struggled with leather as part of our supply chain. Um, you know, we, we want to make multifunctional product that works in an urban area as well as in the back country. And leather is one of these materials that's like, it actually is very high performing. So it's breathable. It molds with you over time. It's very durable. It looks great in a city. You know, it's, it's just, it's one of these things. It's just, it's just like an incredible material. And, you know, immediately when we said, okay, we want to have a leather piece in the line, we were, okay, what are the options? You know, vegan leather, you know, fully recyclable, sounds fantastic, feels terrible. Okay. It feels like you're wearing, it feels like you've wrapped yourself in a plastic garbage bag and you're like working out in that, you know, which is not fun. Um, uh, like recycled leather, similar issue. You know, it just doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel the same. So the first thing that we wanted to do before we tried those two was get our hands on mushroom leather, right? Everybody's talking about it. The cool thing about mushroom leather is, it, first of all, it just sounds really cool, right? But the second thing is, uh, and the second thing is everyone loves mushrooms, okay? Which is also great. So, so both of those things are fantastic. But it's not really ready for prime time, you know, and it's it's definitely not ready to be put like our garments are meant to be worn for a really long time. And it's very frustrating for us to see, okay, you know, Lululemon made a yoga mat out of it, but you know, Lululemon is is manufacturing tons and tons and tons of stuff, you know. It's it's questionable whether that can even be used. Adidas, same thing. Oh, they made something out of it, really cool. But in reality, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not there for the use that we want it. And it's, and we're so far down the food chain in terms of being able to get it. So to see, you know, what Ingvar is doing is really exciting because, uh, you know, I'm all ears, right? I'm like, okay, what else are, you know, what else is out there that we could possibly get our hands on that would perform like conventional leather, but without having the detrimental environmental impacts. And, you know, I think it's, it's a wonderful challenge for me to have to come up with an interesting way to brand his innovation like that that's where I think that you know so many especially apparel manufacturers have, have fallen down like you've been able to waterproof garments with 
you know, palm seed oil and microalgae for a decade at least, but nobody marketed that in a creative way, right? They gave it some kind of like sciencey gimmicky name. Everybody's like, what is this Ecotex thing, you know? And no one cared about it. So um, it's a lot of fun actually to think about how to how to be creative and 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 tell stories with with supply chain decisions that are very difficult. Ingvar, I mean, she she basically that's the best introduction I could have ever facilitated for you right there. Tell, tell yeah. us a little bit where you plug into the equation I'll, 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 I'll and a little bit it. of the science behind it as well. Cause I mean, this is your moment to, for us to geek out on what you're building. Yeah. So um, when we look at the supply chain and kind of the availability of materials in market, um, I wish I could sit here and say, we can supply everybody with all the, all the hides that they're looking for and, uh, and we can work with all partners. Um, and then I also wish that I could say I had started this 10 years ago, so we were further along. Um, but, um, but unfortunately, kind of the reality of it is that everything, you know, innovation takes a long time to bring to market, um, which, which, is, which is frustrating. Um, but also seeing kind of the interest in the market has really shifted, not just kind of, not just I mean, seeing that from consumers and, and now brands are actually wanting to make the change. Uh, but that also helps, of course, funnel investment dollars into into the space, and that's really important for anything to be to kind of get off the ground. Now, you know, if, when we look at what we're doing, um, we of course, yeah, we take a harmless biopsy from a from a cow. Um, we then expand those cells in our in our lab, and uh, we then seed them um, into into a, a, a reactor that we have designed and built ourselves. And um, through you know, in the in the time of three to four weeks, we grow. What is essentially a full thickness, uh, you know, full thickness uh, calf hide that is um, that can then go into tanning. Um, we are of course very careful to choose our tanning partners because we don't want to go down the route of you know, chromium tan and and using those heavy metals. And uh, so it's it's been really important for us to find those partners that that are innovating on something that is as you know old school as, as, as traditional tanning. So finding those people that are really pioneers um, in, the, in the tanning and finishing using environmentally friendly processes. Um, and of course, because again, we just grow what is needed rather than having a full thickness cowhide that needs to then be shaved off. And um, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of solid waste goes into, into a landfill um, after the processing of a traditional hide, we just grow what is needed. So again, you know, if, uh, we use 90% fewer chemicals, we use much less water. It takes I mean, around three days to get to a crust stage instead of seven days for a traditional hide. So again, we, we, we see all these benefits of the, of, the kind of, of the technical performance of what we're doing. Um, but then, of course, yes, we do run into the into the into the um, a challenge of we're scaling it up. We're working with 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 a partner that is going to be announced soon, and um, and um, I wish that it took less time. And uh, and and uh, but but unfortunately, there is there is a process of development, innovation, um, and engineering that has to has to be put in place. But I think we're in a really exciting time right now because we have companies like yours, Joy, that uh, that are really wanting to innovate in this space and are asking those hard questions and um, and where, where you have you have a product that that you have an incredibly high bar of performance that you did that you set so again it's 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 up to companies like ours is to really kind of prove prove that to you and uh, prove that to the industry um, that that yes it does perform uh, as well or if if not even better um, and it has those kind of uh, qualities that that you're, you're looking for in in the in traditional letters um, so so yeah it's an extremely exciting time um, I wish that I could kind of fast forward ten years and uh, and and the supply chain is already set up and uh, we're delivering to everybody um, but but yeah we're working very very hard on it so supply chain has a few elements to it and and I just want to touch on one that uh, we haven't discussed so that. Obviously, there is the, the availability of the supply chain. You know, Joy, you touched on that. Then there's the quality. Ingvar, you touched a little bit about that. But then the last point of it is the logistics of it. And I think the, you know, you can have the right factory. You have your batch order in there. Joy, you got it. In. But if it takes, you know, five months to get over here because of whatever number of geopolitical issues in COVID, you, you're still back, you know, to the beginning of the race. And Ingvar, um, one of the things that, really excites me about what you're building is that you shift the conversation about a farm in Brazil making leather from a cow to a lab 
uh, Vitra Labs lab being literally right next to the tannery, which might be in an entirely different continent. So I wanted to just talk about like what what does the future of sustainable products looks like look like for both of you from a logistics point of view, which is really to reduce some of the carbon offset um, carbon emissions that come from just getting something that's potentially green to where it needs to be put together. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick that off. Um, the um, it's something that we've thought a lot about um, because we have our facility here in uh, in, uh, in in the Bay Area in, in California, and um, one of the big questions were like, well, are we going to manufacture everything here and just ship it around the world? And the question was always like, hard no. There is no again when we look at the supply chain for a traditional cowhide, it can come from as you say from a farm in Brazil. Um, it then gets shipped halfway across the world to, um, to where it gets processed into a, into a crust, whether that is in India and in Cambodia and in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, and then that kind of crust stage, which is um, kind of the technical definition of like a, where it has been, um, where it has been changed from a living hide into, into kind of, it's been, the uh, collagens has been, have been cross-linked, all the kind of the living parts of the hide have been, have been removed, of course. Then in that crust stage, then you get shipped to Europe for, for retanning and, and finishing. So again, a hide can travel around 17,000 miles before it actually reaches the place of production. Now, from a supply chain standpoint, how it is done now, it has made sense because it is a byproduct of the or co-product of the meat industry, depending on who you talk to. But um, and then uh, so again, kind of that supply chain has been very fragmented. Now, when we have been looking at how we would want to do things, it's just hyper localizing. Um, so again, we can build that lab farm next to the tannery, um, whether that is in, uh, in Italy, in France, or or anywhere else in the world. So and then we can dial up and down the demand with uh, with just a few weeks' notice instead of having to. I mean, we have we've seen that some of those large, um, you know, large luxury companies have started buying kind of abattoirs or farms just to have kind of to 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 secure their supply chain. So so it's really important for us to be able to grow locally process locally and make into product locally. And uh, that of course saves, well, not just the carbon emissions from, from a global um, global supply chain, but also allows um, brands to move much faster when it comes to actually making the product that, uh, that they're looking to make. Um, because of course, demand can be quite elastic. So again, there, there might be a huge surge in demand for a specific product when you can know, when you know that you can have those hides tanned, grown tanned and finished um, in a month and a half, rather than having to wait six to six to twelve months for for the traditional supply chain um, to to function and kick into gear, that is something that that brands, of course, and ultimately consumers will benefit from. How are you thinking about that, Joy? Oh, so so actually, very naively in the very beginning, we thought, okay, you know, we have all these options of where to produce, but we were in the middle, you know, of COVID basically when we decided to to get going, and so. We, we chose to produce in Portugal because it's close to us and we knew that it would be easy to get there. It's within the EU, we're in Paris. And so, you know, we thought, okay, look, at least we're gonna minimize, you know, as much as we can in terms of like, you know, transportation from Asia and shipping from Asia and all that stuff. It's still, it's, you know, it still turned out to be a huge issue because the lead times for, there's still our ingredients, if you will, in the garments that come from all over the world, you know, just as you just described. And that because the supply, global supply chain is in such a state of disruption right now, there we, we get lead times for things that are just like unprecedented. You know, we're, we're, we're working with one of the, I consider one of the best factories in the world. They really know what they're doing. And they've, they, you know, they're seeing like, for example, one of the things that really, you know, stumped us lately is zippers. You know, we're making something, a big part of our sustainability focus is to make something that's multifunctional and modular. And do you know how you make something that's multifunctional and modular? It takes a lot of zippers <laughs> to do it, you know? And the, and the zipper supply chain is crazy right now. Like nobody had ever seen anything like that. It's like, oh my gosh, we might miss out, you know, like, this could delay our launch for nine months actually, because we missed the whole season if we can't sort the zipper situation out. But I'll give you another area that we also hadn't expected. And that is, um, so, so basically everyone's having to be very agile and responsive. But there are some ways in which choosing sustainable materials can, um, you know, just constrain you in ways that you hadn't anticipated. And another way for us has been um, 
you know, there's so much waste associated with e-commerce and everything that we're shipping is going to be in, you know, biodegradable packaging. We actually have these, um, you know, the hang tags are made out of seed paper so you can plant them and then, you know, water them and something will grow. Sounds great, right? But it has a shelf life. Like used to be, you could order packaging. You just let it sit on the shelf for like three years and, you know, work through it all. But now we actually have to deal with like a shelf life of the packaging itself because it's organic matter. So um, it's, it's been an adventure, I have to say. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. I've, I've heard that um, brands, um, larger brands, like larger food retail brands, for example, one, one company in particular that I know that they had to make a decision about what packaging they use for like food products. And they did have an option for a more uh, sustainable um, option, but they said they it reduced the shelf life in a supermarket by half, which meant that the, the, the supermarkets had less time to, to, to sell the items, which would in theory kind of include wastage because if they didn't sell it, then it ends up in a bin anyway. So like, how, how are you guys seeing that balance uh, being managed by brands? How, how are they managing this sort of trade-off between going gung-ho on things that, you know, potentially are actually premature, they sound good on paper, but prematurely you're actually just predisposing them to go to the bin. And then also what, what is the role that brands need to have in recapturing uh, used products. You know, you look at Apple is now taking products back because I mean, there's, it's, there are heavy metals and there's valuable metals and laptops, but we're talking about like clothing retail products. And is there only a matter of time till, till that happens? So maybe, maybe feel free to touch on those or both or, or either or. Well, the, I mean, we, we kind of joke that like, you know, if, if we're making nothing, we definitely don't have any kind of sustainability issue. It's like, you know, the most sustainable brand is one that actually makes absolutely nothing. So we always try to keep it in perspective that first and foremost, we have to make something that people really want. And, and that's, that's really where our focus is. And, all, and I think people want something that's sustainably produced, but they want a lot of other things too, right? They want to, just to get back to your Tesla example, like Tesla has been such a huge success, not just because of its environmental bona fides, but because it so strongly signals environmental bona fides by the people that drive it, you know? So there's a, there's a lot to um, kind of think about, but to, to get to your question around, you know, circularity and sort of, which is basically what the apparel industry is calling, you know, producing with the end in mind and, and, and taking full life cycle responsibility for the product. One of the coolest things that I'm seeing is actually a lot of competition for within brands to get their garments back because we're now all realizing how valuable it is to actually be able to resell our own garments. So that's actually a very strong focus for us as well is how do we launch in a way that makes sure everything that we make comes back to us so that we can then pass it on to other, other customers. And by the way, you know, just, I think, you know, I was a part of the team at Patagonia that launched Warnwear. We had such resistance to launching that. I mean, everyone would say, oh, you know, you put used, items on the website and nobody it's going to just you know kill the brand it's going to you know undermine the credibility of what we make from a technical perspective it's just going to be a huge turn off everything's going to feel like a thrift store and that has turned out to be completely wrong like people really love it they love knowing that that they're the second user of something they love knowing that they're passing it on to someone else so um, I think you just can't you really have to question a lot of preconceived notions about consumer behavior because everyone will always say to you like oh you know you, you can't change it, but like, actually that is the most fun that, you know, that's kind of like the funnest challenge in the world for me is to find a way to tap into people's innate goodness, innate desire to, to, you know, have a positive impact on the world and, and shape their behavior in that way. Maybe Ingvar, if, if you want to touch on, on that a little bit, but also on that, on that first point as well, or re regarding how, how are you seeing the people you're collaborating with balance going too far down one path and it turns out it's more wasteful than, than, than the alternative. Yeah, and so there's a lot of again, kind of going back to my 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 the first point that I made uh, when we started the podcast is around you know the understanding of the impact that different uh, materials have or different different processes have, um, and it's something that you know I, I see that companies are putting a lot of work into. Some some have already done that for 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 decades. Others are just starting out, but really understanding kind of what is the impact that every single component or part of the process has. Um, and without that kind of foundational information or that foundational kind of um, the, the foundational understanding, it's hard to make educated decisions because something might sound a lot better 
um, on paper, but then again, when you actually go through the entire lifecycle analysis, uh, you see that it is actually not better. So, so again, for us, it's it's really important to understand that. So we're in the in the process of doing a lifecycle analysis right now with a, with a very famous um, American university here, and uh, and it's really you know been a lot of work around data collection from our side, but also data collection from the industry now. When the um, when we you know in the specific vertical of leather that I work in, um, understanding so the companies that we're working with we're starting in the luxury space. Um, so luxury companies already have this you know it's in, it's built into their business model creating durable products. So again, you're not buying a you're not buying a luxury handbag to throw it out. Uh, after you won it a, a few times. So it's really, you know, the circularity aspect has already been built into, into the luxury model. Now, we've seen, of course, the younger consumer of today, they're taking this a step further with the success of companies like the Real Real and other kind of resale platforms, um, StockX and, and others. And it's really kind of understanding how consumers are using the products that, that are being made because um, a consumer today, buys a product, make, maybe wants to only wear it a handful of times, 10 times, but they also then want to know that they can resell it and, um, and they would never throw away something. They see it, they might see it as an investment, might see it as something where they might not lose that much money if they, if they kind of get some enjoyment out of it and, and for it to, to resell. So, so again, it's the kind of the idea of, of products being reused, uh, products being remarketed and the stigma around secondhand or, or pre-owned or kind of all the all the versions of that kind of it's being marketed as the stigma is completely gone i mean nobody nobody is going to nobody holds it against you if you if you bought a handbag from re the real real because again it's it's authenticated it, it it has it has it's a beautiful product and and so really the understanding of reusability and uh, the understanding of the circularity and um, and and you know, maximizing the use of products is something that is really uh, important for companies. Now, again, there's still a lot of information that has to be gathered on on when we kind of because again we're not making um, product as like uh, like Joy is so so again um, she has a yeah there's a huge challenge to really understanding every component that goes into your product and how that impacts um, how that impacts the environment. Um, so 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 yeah, it's a, it's an interesting time we live in for sure. Yeah, I mean, kind of jumping from that, we're definitely living in a very decisive decade that'll mark the direction our planet goes. And I was actually chatting to um, Sophia, one of our founders, uh, Building Club Zero, which is like a renewable packaging for takeaway service about this topic. And she mentioned the shifting nature of um, shareholder primacy to stakeholder interests. So like historically, we know Milton Friedman um, as the American economist known for his work in consumption analysis and monetary history. Um, and his work supported us thus far to kind of build substantially, but not um, sustainably. And this is kind of the process that we're breaking from now. And obviously we have like ESG measuring all these stakeholder interests. Um, so Joy, what are kind of the key steps um, that consumers should be taking to empower these businesses? And how is the role of the shareholder changing? Well, I think the whole kind of like Milton Friedman neoliberal world, world view is just it's just losing traction with everyone right I mean the in, in some ways you know probably the greatest threat to, to what we're doing is the younger generation is just complete skepticism of anything associated with capitalism period right it's just and, and I think there's such a, a temptation to just kind of like throw the baby out with the bathwater when as, whereas reality I think we all have a responsibility to, to reinvent business and what it can be which is why we're so focused on gender equality and trying to build a business that's post-patriarchal, right? So like, if we're able to do that, what are the ways in which we can transform capitalism to work more effectively for every stakeholder who's involved in that? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of controversy around ESG and, and that, that whole approach to investing. Like there is a lot, there's a lot of question around whether the, um, uh, you know, whether the returns are really there, whether the environmental impact is really there. I think it's like very much in dispute. And actually, I think that's, I think that's fine because I think what's happening now is there are just a critical mass of talent 
and of people and of, you know, whether you're a shareholder, whether you're a consumer who just want to do the right thing, right? We're just staring down this climate crisis and all we want to do is the best possible thing that we can do in light of that looming catastrophe. So, and, and, and we all feel that and we all want to affirm that in each other. So that's why, you know, Ingvar, you mentioned, um, you know, secondhand goods. It's a badge of honor to wear that stuff now, especially among young people, right? They, you know, it's, it's if you show up in something that's like, or you're seen shopping at Zara or H&M or a fast fashion place, it's kind of like, what's wrong with you? You don't, don't you understand what's happening in the world? So I just think it's like, it's more of a, 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 you know, a cultural shift that's happening that we're all participating in together. And, and it's just about, hey, you know what? We're in it together. We're all going to do the very best that we can do. And we're going to be very clever and creative to do it in a way that, that actually delivers a valuable business and growth. And so the last thing I would just say about this is I actually think that we have an imperative to find sustainable ways to grow. Like I tend to believe, like I think growth is part of, it's part of an ecosystem growth and regeneration. It's very much a part of the, of, of, of what makes life on planet earth work. And so I think finding ways to decarbonize, you know, to drive circularity, to actually grow a business without necessarily growing your footprint. It just, it feels like a, like an ethical and more moral imperative now. Yeah. When we look at, I mean, historically, and again, kind of we can we can be frustrated about it where we're sitting kind of looking back today but again it's we're sitting here now and we have to look forward it's really around you know, there have been the negative externalities of companies have just not been factored in uh, you know, calculated into the equation here so it's it's really i mean when we look at you know, carbon emissions for example i mean they're not priced into what we're buying um so I would love to see, and I hope that this is a change that will happen in some countries, probably quicker than others, but where carbon is actually going to be taxed, or at least the subsidies for companies that are you know, emitting a lot of carbon um, get, get, get reduced. Um, so for example, I mean, the um, industrial animal agriculture uh, industry in the, in the US, um, they get, I mean, over the last 10 years, they've had $150 billion worth of subsidies. Um, so, Again, that's around $10 billion a year. Do I think that the US will ever start taxing kind of carbon emissions from, from livestock? Probably not. Um, but, but again, kind of, we can at least level the playing field in terms, of, in terms of either removing subsidies or starting to give subsidies to companies that are doing something that is better for, for the environment. Because again, we're not, for everything that we consume, we're not paying the real price. Um, so I think that's going to be a really, uh, really important uh, next step. So both from a, from, a, from, a, from a consumer perspective, understanding that, yes, um, sustainable products, sustainability, sustainable, sustainability being a very broad term, but, but you know, products that are good for the environment, they do cost more money, that education, education has to happen. Um, but also from an investor's perspective, um, because, of course, investors do have um, a lot of say in when it comes to policy and, and I mean, they, they can make their voice heard. So I think we've seen we're seeing a huge shift in, in, in you know, money going into uh, into ESG companies or companies that are doing um, something better for the climate. So so it's yeah, trying to level the playing field, um, education of, of consumers. And then again, I'm going to just make this point one last time. It's like the understanding and kind of the building the foundation of understanding of of the negative and positive externalities of, of products that are being made. So I think that's a, just a, the education part. Yeah, on the education of... point, Ingvar, I, I agree. One of the fun questions I, I ask at uh, end of podcasts in the past, sometimes around how do you link that? And one example that I give is like, capitalism is around um, helping a fishing company sell more fish with no linkage to the reproduction cycle of that fish. So you're perversely incentivized to overfish because that's how your stock price goes up. And at the moment, there is no quantitative method by which you can factor in that, that, um, that stock of fish into the price of fish. So you, you, you're not preventing the market from, from existing. You're just pricing that in. And that isn't currently there. And I think that's going to be part of the future. So that yeah, totally, totally agree with that point. So we're going to conclude with a fun question for both of you. Um, if you uh, if, if you don't uh, have a book that comes to mind, um, you can make one up or you can tell me how it is. So 
which science fiction book do you think will most likely represent our future? And if you don't have one that comes to mind, paint an image of what you think the future in 10 years will look like based on what's going on right now on both the climate side of things and societal change that's going on in 2021. I'll start with a book that I've read. I hope that it, I hope that that will not be the case because it's quite dystopian, but Min The Ministry for the Future by uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, I think is an incredible book. It is very scary. Um, it doesn't kind of leave you feeling too good after reading it, but it is a very insightful and very, um, very well-written account of uh, a, a future where climate change has absolutely run amok. And uh, so I, I, I hope that we will be able to improve uh, our, 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 our ways um, before, before it hits. But yeah, it's an incredible book. Okay, I'm gonna recommend to cheat a little bit. Okay, so, and, the, and, the first, and they both have a lot to do with our brand that we're building. So the first is uh, William Gibson's pattern recognition. And um, in some ways I hope the world really looks like that in the future, it's slightly dystopian as William Gibson also, often is. But uh, the heroine is very much amused for early majority. So she has this very streamlined, minimal way of dressing. Um, she's, her name is Case Pollard, and she wears these things called Case Pollard units, which she calls CPUs. And uh, that kind of like, she has, also has very strong brand intuition. She's sort of like a brand soothsayer. So Pattern Recognition by William Gibson, highly recommend it. We're essentially making CPUs. Um, and then the second one is uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman wrote a book called Her Land, which is kind of a feminist utopia. And I think that's a really important book to read because things go kind of wrong in that feminist utopia. And the reason that they go wrong is because there's not enough diversity in the community. And it turns out that when everyone is the same and they all think the same thing, things get really gnarly. So I think that's a really important one to remember because we are, you know, you, you know, women can't be liberated unless men participate, obviously, you know, and it's so much more fun when we're all working together. And I think it's the same with any kind of, um, you know, any kind of utopia that we may dream of together. It's, it's only going to be great to the extent that it's really diverse. Well, I am so happy to be part of both of your stories. Um, if there's anything I'm left in the world here with a legacy, it's having been able to be part of your both journeys. So with that, guys, thanks for joining. Thank you Thank so much. You. For Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Until next time. Great to be here. Thanks.